Jeff Snyder here with director Tom Harper, the director of The Aeronauts and Wild Rose, which if you've you know been watching Collider all year, you've definitely heard me talk about it at some point on the air. We will uh, save some questions about Wild Rose for the very end of this because I got to geek out. But we, we have to talk about The Aeronauts because this is a movie that's about to come out. And I feel like it's being overlooked almost with, in, in, with award season. Like this is a really great old fashioned adventure movie with two really strong leads and maybe even Felicity Jones is like most charming performance that I've seen her give. I thought you did an incredible job. So th congratulations. Thanks Jeff. Thank you. And how, so how did you first get involved with this project? What, you know, how long have, uh, ago did you sign on and all that? Uh, it, it's actually come from, from the inception to screen remarkably quickly or quicker than I've ever worked on anything before. Cause usually it's, it takes such a long sure. gestation period. There's a labor of love. Um, but I was actually, I was in Russia with my cinematographer and we were shooting war and peace and he'd heard a snippet of this balloon flight in 1862 that was in a book that was about to be published, read out on the radio. And he said, wouldn't it be an amazing thing to, uh, make a movie all set in the sky? and what visual opportunities that could provide. And so that was the starting point. And then I went and read about the flight and a whole bunch of other flights and some of the extraordinary things that happened at the time. And, and in this book, I, I guess everything in the film, or 90% of what happens in the film actually happened for real, mm -hmm. uh, but not all at the same time. Sure, sure, understandably. Yeah. It's like everything that goes wrong feels like it does. Yeah, like, exactly. And, and it becomes <laughs> an, a really impressive, uh, incredible story of survival. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what's it like shooting within the confines of a hot air balloon? Had you ever been up in a hot air balloon before you made this movie? Yeah, yeah I had actually on my dad's 60th birthday and, okay. and I loved it actually. But that, um, but this is actually a gas balloon. So this is, this is because it's a, in right, the 19th right, right. century, Forget it's like, it's, it's, I guess it's like a birthday balloon. It's full of gas lighter than air yep. and it, it takes you up. Um, and I'd never been in a gas balloon before, but they, they really are wonderful things. And I suppose the, that was one of the starting points for us was when we realized we were gonna make the film is, well, can we build a 19th century gas balloon? And it turns out we could, and can we put our cast in it? And we could, and so we did a, you know, a, a real fair chunk of the film for real with our cast in the basket, 3000 feet above, above London. That is wild. I mean, did, did uh, Felicity or, or you or, or Eddie, do they have any fear of heights? No, I mean, they were fearless. I, I have to say they went, did more than I ever thought that they would, or indeed I would do, and I have immense admiration for them. You know, Felicity did almost all of her own stunts, and um, yeah, she really put her through herself through it. It was one of her, you know, right from the very beginning, she was adamant that you know to to she wanted her performance to be as physical as possible and therefore to embrace as much of the physical action as possible. And she really did. She started training six months beforehand. Um, she really went to extreme lengths. And I think you can really see that in her performance. Absolutely. I mean, and I feel like a lot of, you know, these kinds of movies, to be frank, you know, features the man saving the woman. And, and this is this kind of turns the tables where she is sort of made to be the hero. Like, well, you know, can you talk about that choice? Yeah, I mean, it didn't, it wasn't like an active thought at the beginning, we're going to make, oh, we're going to make the woman the hero in this. It just came from a point of, well, this, that, f the flight that it's primarily based on, where they went to 36,000 feet, which is higher than anyone's been before or since in a balloon without additional oxygen, um, was a remarkable, remarkable flight just because of how high they went. But um, James Glacier and the, the pilot he was with, Henry Coxwell, uh, they didn't really speak in the in on that flight because they were so busy taking measurements and whilst what they achieved was remarkable two people in a basket not talking to each other doesn't necessarily make for the most interesting movie sure so we looked to other uh, characters and to other balloon flights to see uh, for inspiration and there was this woman sophie blanchard who lived 40 years previously and she was a kind of a firecracker of a woman who who was flamboyant and uh, did acrobatics and would set off fireworks from her basket. And she became Napoleon's head of aeronauting, head of ballooning. Okay. And every time he had a military procession, she'd be there with a slogan on the balloon. And so, um, and actually she tragically fell to her death when she set off a firework into her balloon, which exploded um, over the Paris skyline. Um, so, so anyway, but she was this... Uh, very sort of markedly different character from the meticulous James Glacier. And so we thought, well, if you put those two in a balloon together and it's a confined space of the basket, that's going to 
provide some sparks. And then just naturally, as a, as because he was the scientist and she was the pilot, and right. because she was the more physical, and more flamboyant, and the more instinctive person, it seemed natural that she would be the person to to to, to do the most of the, the action, and and is indeed the person that goes to the extreme lengths at the the, the top of the atmosphere sure i see so it's not like it's a true story per se but two true two true stories kind of melded together in a sense yeah i mean it draws from a number of true stories gotcha. i guess there's, it's sort of inspired by a bunch of the flights that actually did happen so so how do you keep things visually interesting though within such a small space because like i imagine that's one of the challenges yeah i'm um, I mean, actually, that is one of the things that really appealed to me about the film because so much of it is actually just two people in a confined space. But right. of course, the whole world is changing with them as they go around. And then they experience all sorts of things from a storm to going through clouds to, you know, to, to kind of fighting for survival as they plummet to Earth at the end. Um, but so we just thought very carefully about how each, le you know, that progression, that visual progression, I suppose, as they go up through the atmosphere and how the layers change and how the sun changes and obviously the sun, the sun setting. And so actually, it's almost like each level of the atmosphere is a different world. Right. It's, it's a, it, was a, it seemed like a great opportunity to play with light. Yeah, 100%. Who, who is the cinematographer on this? I, I Forgive me. It's my friend and frequent collaborator, a guy called George Steele. We did Peaky Blinders together, which okay. is where we met. And we then since did War and Peace, Wild Rose. So we've worked together a bunch. Yeah, I, I just thought the, the look of this film, it was very um, majestic. Thanks, I, I yeah. Say. Yeah, I mean, also, we really wanted it to feel modern in the basket as well. So the, 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 there are some flashbacks in, in the movie and they're all shot on anamorphic lenses. They're much more period and feel, much more static camera. But everything in the basket is really, we wanted it to feel like a mo modern film. And I've always, that was all, the thing that always strikes me about when I work on period dramas is actually, you know, we're, we're just the same. You know, but think that the, 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 the setting has changed and there are many things that have sort of material things that have changed, but the fundamental human emotions are exactly the same mm -hmm. um, pretty much. And so it's about accessing that as, as closely as possible. I, I like that um, Eddie, you know, was kind of like all business and, and Felicity was a bit of a showman. And there's a scene early where she's kind of showing off for the crowd that involves a dog. Yeah. Uh, do, does the audience, like, what is the reaction <laughs> to that moment? Because I feel like I gasped. Like, it's always great seeing it with an audience and that the, the audience are always like leap up at that moment, <laughs> at that moment. yeah, <laughs> yeah it's I, good I, I, I mean imagine. that's another thing that actually happened um without oh, any wow. meaning to spoil spoilers but yeah they they I mean, they throw the dog out of the basket i mean it doesn't <laughs> doesn't ruin too much does it <laughs> i was like oh my god that, that poor dog and then the but the dog has a parachute like, the dog's yes. fine oh my god and actually it was a stunt dog it wasn't a real dog was it really we didn't throw the real dog out of the basket that would have been not good <laughs> right so this stunt dog was used to getting thrown around <laughs> yeah no the stunt dog was like a, a very expensive stuffed dog not i mean I, it wasn't a, not an see. actual stuffed dog i got like you a, i didn't know i, I don't know <laughs> I, you know imagine if there were actual like stunt dogs yeah um, do you feel any increased pressure since this is sort of the reunion of these two actors who were in this like you know well-reviewed movie like was, was was this actively seen as like a reunion when you guys are working together shooting it yeah i mean i guess so i mean what you know it's it, it is a reunion i guess of, of sorts but um but it, it was never a pressure i don't think I mean, now it is that you were asking it, but at the time it wasn't. It was just a pleasure because because they they got on so well and they had such a great chemistry and rapport together. And and actually, it was a sort of a great sort of starting bedrock to start them to making the movie. And I mean, if they didn't get on, two people in a confined space for ninety minutes would have been would have been challenging. Um, so I, so I, I got to ask you the tough questions here. Tom. Yeah, good. And and so when Amazon comes to you and says, you know, we've decided to switch our strategy a little bit and give yeah. this film a two week re release before it comes to Prime in time for the holidays, so everybody will be able to watch it, you know, uh, with their families over the holidays. But it means that the IMAX release that you'd plan for is sort of out the window. Like, wh what's your reaction to this? Is it frustrating? Do you understand the emphasis on streaming? Like, where are you coming from in all of this? I think it's a combination of all sorts of things, really. Um, in truth, it's it, you know it, it was designed to be shown on the big screen. It is a spectacle. It is a big screen experience. Um, so I want as many people to see it on the big screen as possible. Um, we do live in a changing times, a rapidly changing times, and there is you know for original films, people to go out and see original films in the cinema is harder to get those audiences and. Um, and what Amazon and Netflix and the streamers are providing in terms of, you know, this is as an original film um, that's not based on IP that is reasonably expensive is 
we wouldn't have got made really anywhere else. And I'm very grateful that we got the chance to make this movie. And that is a great thing. And if it, it wouldn't necessarily be made if, um, if it weren't, if it weren't for the streamers. So, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that, that, that it doesn't get a longer release. I would like, I hope that people make the choice to go out and see it on the big screen at the same time as I'm pleased that loads of people are going to, millions of people worldwide will get to watch it over Christmas, um, on Amazon prime. So, you know, it's just, um, it's a factor of the changing world and you have to roll with it and embrace the opportunities that that provides. And if that means that they're going to give us the money to make films like aeronauts, then that's a good thing. Right. Well, I mean, I wanted to ask about that. Like as, as a storyteller, like what do you make of the current streaming wars? Like in this, in this hunger for content is, is it, is now a, a better time than ever to be a creator in a sense or. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's harder to get your work noticed, I think, um, because mm -hmm. there is so much. Right good material out there but that sort of provokes you and challenges you to think harder about what you do and to uh, in a drive for excellence as well you know you know you're looking for things that really cut through that will really capture people's imagination so yeah i think i think there's so much great great material out there and that's that's a fan and even you know and and films as well you know with the with with the with the combination of the big um ip and the big franchises and then all everything that the stream is making the more original lower budget stuff it feels like it's, it's very rich rich um spectrum so this is your second film this year I, and i know that wild rose was shot a while ago and, and the release got held up a little bit but like i feel like this is like your your, your spielberg moment or, or clint eastwood <laughs> moment where two big movies uh two two really good movies in the same year uh, has it opened more doors for you in the industry you taken more meetings and stuff off these movies well, we just finished this like a, you know only a few weeks ago so oh, okay. well seven weeks ago and i've been running around with it going to festivals and and stuff so i haven't really stopped to think and and I, actually what i really i'm looking forward to is just taking a step back and watching some other movies and recharging the creative batteries and just going to some museums and reading some books and you know that kind of thing <laughs> what kind of stuff do you like to read i'm curious because i think reading is a lost art these days like no i, I don't know a lot of people who go home and just read for pleasure and it's sad to me because i love books what are you reading I, I actually read like the stuff i read for pleasure is sort of almost stuff that can't be work if you know what i mean so i tend to read like essays i've been reading um uh, in praise of shadows which is a sort of an essay a ja on japanese aesthetics okay <laughs> weirdly hey. i've been reading to each their own uh, a book about trees i've been you know sort of quite <laughs> random things that could not be work related um because i think that you know so much of my life is dominated by filmmaking right to find spaces where you and, yeah. can just philosophy or uh or or um nature or aesthetics or you know whatever right. it is just to stretch the other parts of your brain and your imagination i think is really useful that, that that's interesting i mean people ask you know i have a lot of friends obviously in this movie space they're always like well why don't you listen to my podcast i'm like i don't want to listen to movie <laughs> podcasts i talk enough about movies yeah. um so so wild rose uh you know was absolutely terrific you'd worked with jesse buckley before on war and peace right yes I so had, what yeah. what uh, made you think that she was right to play this character rosalind well, Jesse, Jesse is a very formidable personality, and she she's someone that I found very inspiring and loved working with on War and Peace, and we were looking for something to work um, on together. So she was in the forefront of my mind, and then and then this script came along that I was actually sort of gearing up to make Aeronauts, and it was taking a bit longer than I expected to come together, and then the script sort of turns up, and and within the two pages of reading it. It was, you know, it was a voice that could only be Jessie's coming from screaming out the page at me. And fortunately, she thought the same thing. And it was a it was it's very rare that you get or I in my experience that I've had like no brainers where it's like, yes, I want to make this film. I know exactly who should play it. It's usually much more gray than that. And you well, I should I shouldn't. I'm not sure you try and convince yourself then you convince yourself out of it. Whereas this was one that was just right from the very beginning is like, I want to make this film and I will got to get to it with Jesse. Um, can you like the reaction to that movie, I think has been through the roof and it sends you out of the theater with chills as she sings this song Glasgow, which I think, it, I mean, is neon giving that an awards push this year in the best original song category? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, I think so. It's uh, you, you know, it's a smaller movie and it's a, it's, it's something that people have discovered over time. So I, I don't think it has the kind of the big surge of the other big awards contenders. So, but I, I hope that people will find it and it seems that more and more people are, are going to find it. And it is an amazing, 
amazing story behind that song because it's written, of course, by Mary Steenburgen, yeah. uh, the actress, uh, the brilliant actress and actually brilliant songwriter because she she had a, uh, there was an article asked about it recently. I just but, read it. It was did fascinating. You? I didn't yeah, know so all this stuff. She, she, went, she had a sort of routine surgery um, for, I think it was an elbow operation or something anyway, but she went under general anesthetic and when she woke up, she could hear music. Um, and it sort of changed her life and, and, and she started writing songs. She couldn't do anything but kind of get the music out. Um, and when we were looking for a song for the end of the movie, we couldn't find it and we were starting to freak out because it's a really, as you know, a, a key part of the movie. Right, I saw, like, I, I think in that art, that same article, it said the end of the script, just says, you know, she sings a, an incredible song and, and, and the end. It was yeah. like, that's easier said than done. Yeah, exactly, and we couldn't find anything. But I think because Mary is an actress and she read the script and got inside the mind of the character, she was able to, right. to capture the emotion of the moment. Um, have you heard from singers who have seen that film and been inspired? I have, I don't know that I have actually. Um, well, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how did you get your start in this business? Uh, I, short films. I, I made a lot of short films, a lot of not very good short films. Mm -hmm. And um, slowly I got better over time, I think. And then I made one called Cubs that sort of captured the zeitgeist for whatever reason. And that, you know, that I made a film just before that, that that I spent a long time trying to raise the money for and we shot it and I actually thought it was pretty good and we sent it to festivals worldwide and it didn't get into, I actually got into one obscure German poetry festival and <laughs> okay. that was it. And then I was all ready to give up and I was feeling very despondent and, and Cubs came together and I thought, well, I'll, I'll do this and if this doesn't work, then that's, you know, that's it. And then for whatever reason, that went everywhere and it was, I, mean, I think it was a better film, but I don't know that it was that much better than the previous one, but it mm -hmm. was just, it hit that vein. And, so that and, got you like signed and everything and, and then it was... Yeah, I mean, it was a slow process. It was that and then another, the next year, the Cubs enabled me to make another short film and then I made some short documentaries and slowly but surely, you know, gathered momentum. And, and do you prefer, I mean, what's the difference, the, the biggest difference for you as a director in terms of working in film and television? Because like you said, you, you've done episodes of Peaky Blinders and uh, some other really cool stuff. It's, um, there are, it, there's, there's some differences in sort of logistics and it's also just about the thinking about the big screen and a, kind of a, what's going to get people to go into, well, it's all changing, of course. Like, sure. yeah, it, it's about, it's about the, I suppose it's about the scope and it's about the time that you have. And it's about really thinking about the kind of the scale of, of, of what you're telling. Um, but often it's not very, it, often it can be not very different. And, and I think it, they're coming, kind, of, kind of coming closer and closer. But, but certainly with something like Aeronauts and Wild Rose, you know, it's in the forefront of your mind as, as you know, things that aren't based on big IP or that aren't a franchise. It's like, what is it, what is it that's going to make people come into a cinema and pay their money and sit, sit through it? Um, and, you, you know, for, for, for the Aeronauts, it's the spectacle, it's the real time quality, it's the, 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 the big sequences that, that hopefully demand to be seen on a big screen. Um, and that will be what gets people in those two weeks before it comes out at Amazon Prime. And I think that for, for Wild Rose, it's the, um, um, it's, you know, it's the music and it's the, but it's also this, I think it's the singularity of the storytelling as well. I, I think it's, you know, the, the compact um, um, uh, perspective of, of, you know, one, one journey usually, but of course there's a million exceptions to any rule. So, so what's next for you? What are you, what are you working on or developing? I mean, I've got a number of things bubbling. Irons in the fire. Irons in fires. Again, like I'm not quite sure. I kind of want to take a beat to recharge, but I do have a project called Gentleman in Moscow that's based on Amor Tools' his book that I'm working on with Ken Branner. Um, so maybe that'll be the thing that bubbles up first. Okay. Are you still attached to do that, uh, the working title thing, uh, Lost for Words? No, I'm not actually. Oh, okay. No, that's, that was a fun yeah, thing I'm that we worked on a while. Page. You, know, <laughs> you can never trust those things. But you can trust me here at the ladder. <laughs> um, all right. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming in. When, when can folks see the aeronauts, both in theaters and on Amazon Prime Video? Uh, December the 6th in the cinema. So I hope as many people as possible go and you see really it in the cinema. You really should check it out on the big screen, really. It deserves to, uh, to be seen up there. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and then two weeks later, December 20th, in time for Christmas on All Amazon right, Prime. perfect. Well, thank you so much for Thanks, coming Jeff. in, Tom. Thanks I appreciate it. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks for watching Collider.com, guys.